my topic is about <clears throat> early strategies for next generations of antimicrobial resistance. And uh, I'll talk a bit about the outcomes from the GPIU study. Now, given that we've overrun, I'll try to be a bit faster than I was uh, anticipating to this slides. Um, I want to be a bit uh, controversial here, and instead of talking about next generations of AMR, I want to rule that out and just say that we're dealing with a, with a severe situation, antimicrobial resistance, that actually has, all, has always been there in the nature. A study published almost uh, 13 years ago, looking into the pristine freshwater, as I identified multiple resistant uh, bacteria in that environment. Essentially, what I'm just trying to say here is that antimicrobial resistant bacteria had always existed. They, it existed in their genomes, but they were not expressing this. We, by uh, um, throwing the antibiotics onto them the past 100 years, have helped them express this. and the, we have more colonies now with higher genes, higher expression of that um, antimicrobial resistant characteristics. So this will just get worse probably with the way things are going at the moment. So uh, as an outline of my presentation, there's two parts I wanna talk about. Part one, AMR in neurology in specific, are actually have been covered throughout the talks uncomplicated versus complicated. Recurrent UTI is very well uh, presented by Chris. And surgical site infections, whether it be the wound, the urinary tract, or the deep tissue, which is, this is the area of research I carry out. Let me give you the conclusion of this presentation from the very beginning. For to tackle antimicrobial resistance, there is no magic wand that's gonna come and provide the solution. It's an interdisciplinary connected um, approach that we require. And I'll expand on what I mean. So to understand the impact of antimicrobial resistance in urology, as part of the European Association of Urology, we've been conducting the GPIU study, which is a point prevalence study in infections in urology. And on the background of that, we've developed other studies and one of the biggest ones is serpents, which we've been looking into eurosepsis. What, we've, what we generally quote is that approximately one third of the healthcare associated infections are the urinary tract. But one thing that's not been said, that's in a hospital environment, and most of these are catheter infections. When we move to the urology department, it's a bit different. We've got around on average 12% healthcare associated UTIs. This has been increasing, but the difference between other departments is that this is not only because of catheters, this is because of the interventions we've been carrying out within the genitourinary tract. And when you look at healthcare associated UTI publications, that doesn't necessarily overlap with our practice. That's a point I would like to highlight. Now, GPIU's study has shown that the prevalence has steadily been increasing and the latest data has shown the same trend continuing. There are other studies also indicating something similar, a similar story. On the x-axis is the time in years. And on the y-axis here, you see 30-day readmission rate after transrectal prostate biopsies, a very common procedure. And what I will highlight here is that readmission rate went up from 1% to 4% in approximately 10 years. And most of these have been infection related. 0.6 versus 3.6 it's gone up to, infection related readmissions. And this was clearly correlated with the fact that antimicrobial resistance has been increasing. We recently published a paper a week ago from the uh, prostate biopsy side study of the GPI, You're looking at 1600 patients. And you can see that post biopsy symptomatic infections have gone up from five to 11% from the first cohort of 2010 to 2013 and the recent cohort. Symptom resolution in two weeks was initially 95%. Now it's dropped down to 76%. So that means that we're not being able to treat our patients either. And these are linked to antibiotic resistance. 
essentially what I've been trying to say. So Zawawi et al, who published this beautiful review at Nature Reviews Urology, has shown that fluoroquinolone resistance, which is the primary antibiotic we've been using for a very long time in prophylaxis for biopsies, let's say, shows a great variation around the globe. But I beg to differ. On my own data analysis from a recent 2018 data, and um, which I looked into the global trends of antibiotic resistance, you will see that dark blue here is beyond 50% resistance or failure rate for fluoroquinolones around the globe. That trend in UTIs has disappeared. And it goes back to the same story, which I was saying at the beginning. The resistance rates in UTIs are very different than what we see in urology, what we see in other departments. So we need our own specific data. The similar trend, I would say, for other antibiotics, amoxicillin, ceftriaxone. You can see a geographical trend, but I, I suspect this will disappear over time also. One thing I also showed through this global data set is that if you're using a data-driven antibiotic selection versus empirical treatment without looking at your data, which is this plot I show on the, uh, on the left side, meaning that you're around 50% likely to get it wrong for severe infections. Whereas if you look into your data and have a info data-informed antibiotic selection, that drops down to 20% in some instances. So actually, you can reduce inappropriate antibiotic usage by almost 30-40% by just looking at your data. Another thing I want to bring your attention to is that the routine prophylactic antibiotic administration rate for a procedure like cystoscopy, diagnostic cystoscopy here. And you can see throughout the globe that there is a great variation, but it's at least 40% routine antibiotic administration, which should actually be zero, because these are uncomplicated patients we have looked at. So that's the part of the difficulty we're uh, dealing with. And everyone touched on to urosepsis, the prevalence of urosepsis we see in urology is around 1.5% after we carry out procedures. And I want to bring your attention to multidrug resistance here, and I'll link it to urosepsis. Now, when we're talking about resistant bacteria, it's not only that they're resistant nowadays to a single antibiotic, which is the not MDR group, even if they are resistant. You have multidrug resistance, extensive drug resistant nowadays, and even pan-drug resistance in some occasions, thankfully very rare. And through the GPIU study, we have shown that these risk factors, such as previous hospitalization, usage of antibiotics, history of UTI, and Charleston comorbidity index are all likely to in increase the chances of uh, having a multidrug resistant urosepsis. Essentially what I'm saying, patients who undergo surgical interventions and develop urosepsis are more likely to have multidrug resistant pathogens. So if you're dealing with a urosepsis post-surgery versus a urosepsis that comes from community, primary onset, no previous intervention, you're dealing with different, um, different urosepsis scenarios. And, uh, and that was a big problem. We were trying to understand what's the impact on our, the patient outcomes. Therefore, we did the serpent study which is epidemiology of urosepsis. I won't go through the details due to the, the time, but we recruited 530 patients and the, we're currently writing the paper. So briefly, just very shortly, I would like to give one thing from this study. As, um, if you're giving your antibiotic late in a urosepsis patient, the time to recovery from kidney failure is doubled. Now, going beyond that, if the patient has a multidrug resistant pathogen causing the infection, their likelihood of uh, developing organ failures and remaining septic increases. If you're over treating them, that remains the same trend also. So, under treating and over treating are both problematic for urosepsis. So I gave you a bit of a background, and I think that summarizes everything that has been said up to this point. And Bashkar has asked me to talk about the future, about the exciting parts for antimicrobial resistance. 
So I'd like to summarize this in three steps. Before the infection, during the infection, and after the infection, what can we do? Each color here indicates policy interventions, new tools, clinical decision tools, or patient behavior. How can we change any one of these to improve or tackle AMR? And you will see that on every stage, you need all of these interventions for it to be successful. Not any one of them would work on their own. I would like to talk about the rapid diagnostics here. I think this is where one of the future directions that we're gonna hear more and more about. First is real time whole gen genome sequencing from the U culture. And this group in Norway who I collaborate with, they directly obtained the whole genome of the bacteria in bloodstream infections after culturing the specimen. So this is after you obtain a culture, roughly speaking within 18 to 21 hours, they will know what the pathogen is. And within 19 to 22 hours, they will know what the susceptibility profile is. So this gives you a time advantage in dealing with a condition like sepsis of three hours, you will know the pathogen, and you, it's a time advantage of around 24 hours in knowing the susceptibility profile. Um, a group in England, uh, David uh, Livermore in Nottingham, he looked at whole genome sequencing, came from directly from the urine this time. And they actually managed to sequence the pathogens within seven hours. And with some calibration, they can even drop that down to four hours. They have a very high accuracy in detecting the pathogen, but not detecting the susceptibility profile. Now, each one of these on their own are very useful, and how we integrate this into clinical decision-making will be studied in the future. In terms of the, how do we utilize our existing data, which I said is quite important for us as urologists to deal with UTIs and resistant pathogens, you need a system that is protocolized, has a standardized data collection approach, and is, has a good IT platform. And for UTIs, unfortunately, this does not exist. Apart from the GPIU study we have been conducting, and now we have, uh, we're going to expand on this. And as I said before, I just want to highlight this again, which is very important, I think. Looking at the Zovavi data, you can see there's geographical variation of fluoroquinolone resistance, but it's not the uh, same when you look at UTI-specific data, which I analyzed over 1 million patients' data to obtain these results. So we're quite confident in what we're saying here. The future, therefore, seems to be that we're going to use rapid diagnostics to identify the pathogen, and we will need the susceptibility pathogen of the information from our data, from our own data. And that, that will help us to uh, inform our antibiotic selection. A few more things new, and I'll go through the next slides very quickly because they already have been um, mentioned. Non-antibiotic treatments, bacteriophages were covered beautifully by Chris, so I'll not talk about the details, but the clinical trial he was talking about, the results were published three days ago. So men with UTI, they go through either placebo bacteriophages or antibiotics and essentially, they've proven that there's non-inferiority with bacteriophages compared to antibiotics in terms of UTI symptom relief and microbiological recovery. So this is groundbreaking, and I think we're going to hear much more in the future. What should I do if I have a patient who's harboring antimicrobial-resistant pathogens? Study published in New England Journal of Medicine a week ago, they randomized patients for decolonization, very simple things, chlorhexidine showers, mouthwash, et cetera. Um, quickly going on to the results of this, within 12 months in the decolonization group, there was a reduction in infection rates. So a very successful, very cheap intervention in terms of carrying out at a populational level. Vaccines, I'm not going to say anything because Chris covered them much in much more depth. So overall, um, tackling AMR, what can we do? As I said, there is no one solution. You have to use all of them. Treatment and prophylactic antibiotic selection will be surveillance-driven, real-time pathogen data-driven. 
bacteriophages, I believe, are promising. Decolonization and such policy interventions for infection prevention will be important. And collection of your own data will be very, very relevant for yourselves. So we have developed a new platform for each country or each region that we can provide this for free and you can collect your own data with the protocol we provide with the standardized measurements and outcomes. And it gives real-time data analytics also this platform. So that will help you in your own site in terms of tr empirical treatment and um, measuring the trends within your unit. Thank you very much.